sights. Oh, middle lights. Praise the Lord. So good to see you guys. Jin Sung's back too. Wow. All right. So yeah, that was, um, hey Wade, nice to see you too. Um, that, was, um, that was touching. That was a touching video, but it's real. It's real life. You know, to think and consider a, you know, in, in today's time that people are still in slavery. Uh, we are very narrow-minded in our vision of what we see of what, how the world treats people. Um, they set the rules, you know. So, um, and that's, um, it, like I say, it's very difficult to see and watch that. But, um, you know, there are people in slavery right here in the United States. And through all the world, it's called slavery to sin. It's a bigger hold than even that. It's more miserable and, and devastating than what we just watched. See, that person could be delivered, could get paid out of slavery, but sin keeps them still in slavery. So that's why it's so important with this and everywhere we go, even in the missionary field, is to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ because that delivers them from the slavery of that God says no man can be delivered from except it be from him. This is why Christ died on the cross. He paid the price there for you and for me. And it's amazing. So as we think today and, and go into this message, you know, I want to relate that, um, you know, God is not against you. you know, I, I, I think, you know, places I go and people I talk to, a lot of them say, well, I can't come to God because I did this or that or this. But, you know, this or that or this is what he died for. You know, but we, we still believe and we think that God is against me. That God is against me. Even Christians, you know, when we sin or we fail, we think now God is against me. But you know what? All of God's judgment was poured upon Christ, all of it. He didn't leave nothing for us to absorb as far as judgment. He put it all upon his son. And thank God for that. Because what would we pay? What would you have to pay to get out of the slavery of sin? What's that cost? It cost us his son. It cost the blood of his son. So God is not against you. And... Um, it just leads me to, you know, sometimes I, um, you know, I, I, I'm starting to see it a lot. I, I, I really dislike when I see other Christians attacking other Christians because of their behavior. And, um, and, and it, we have to stop that <laughs> because it's not how God will deal with that person. God's very capable of dealing with you and dealing with me. We don't have to correct individuals. Now, there will be a time where there is correction from the pulpit, but when it consistently is coming and it's the same people doing it, then, you know, God is for us. Satan is against us. God, though, is for us. And, and let's, let's turn, let's start in Isaiah chapter 42. Isaiah 42, verse 1. And these are, this is the start of, in the book of Isaiah, what are called the servant songs. And they're all concerning Christ. Every single one of these, and they're all through, it, it goes even all the way through Isaiah 
53. And it's, it's, they're called songs about his, the, God's servant. And that's what Christ is. He was the servant of the Most High God. And, and he says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentiles. This is something, this is in the Old Testament, and he's saying, my servant is going to be the one that brings forth judgment. And, um, and I have put my spirit upon him. And, and Jesus Christ fulfilled that in Luke chapter 4, where he said, behold, the spirit of God is upon me to, bel- to bring deliverance to those who are in captivity. Many are in captivity. You know, here we watched physical slavery. The captivity was in bondage to their bodies. and strength. But there's also a captivity to our mind and our thinking. If Satan can capture the mind of an individual, he has you. This is why dependencies on drugs and alcohol and all these things are all a, an attack against one's thoughts and thinking. And, um, and because we're a different person when we think that way. So then he says in verse 3, and I love this, and this is Christ. Look at, he says, A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoking flask he shall not quench. And boy, if this doesn't tell us that God is for us, there's no verse that can touch you. <laughs> you know, this is incredible on, you know, um, we, we look at our lives and we're so weak and we're so bruised and we're so inflicted and we've gone through so much hardship and problems and, and we fall in depression and weakness and sickness and shame and guilt and all these things are the root of sin. That's where the, it comes from. That's the root. There's tendencies above that that I can counsel and direct people in and help them in but if we don't deal with the root if you don't deal with the root the weed continues to come the weed will continue to spread out you can put all the weed killer you want and some of them say last for three months and two weeks later that same stupid weed comes up again you know but and that's what our and that's what the root does because we have to get to the root. And, and I love this. He says, a bruised reed, this, this bruising, this pain, this, this speaks in the, in the Hebrew language as oppression. Did you see oppression when you watched that video? I've seen a lot of it, a lot of heaviness. Here, the, this oppression this bruise, a bruise is, you ever notice a bruise is bleeding on the inside. It's not an outward wound. It's something that's happening internally. And, and, it's, and it's bleeding. It needs attention. It, it's, it's relaying to the mind and to the body that send blood to this area. Send reinforcement here. And, and this bruising, this oppression that happens within our life, um, and, and this is a reed that, if you've ever seen reeds, I mean, some of them are erect and, and strong. And they would even use these reeds for playing violins, you know. But once it breaks, once that reed breaks, it's used for nothing but to f- burn and throw into the fire. God, Jesus Christ is saying here, listen, this oppression that's over my people, I'm not going to break it. It looks broken, but I am going to still accept it just the way it is. And then a smoke and flax, he will not put out. He will not quench. And, and the smoke and flax is, is the fire is already out. The only thing left is a smoking little area that comes when you put out a candle. You can even take your fin, finger and quench that and stop that smoking God is saying, I'm not even going to do that with them. Because if it's smoking just a little bit, I'm going to bring a fire back to it. I'm going to bring a fire back to that life, and that fire is going to show light, 
and, and give heat. And there's going to, and, and it, in other words, with all these defects, all this defection that's here, God says, I still have a hope for them. And I can still use them even in that condition. You know, you might think it's useless. There's nothing else that this can work for. And God said, oh, no. I, I see so much in that smoking flask. I, it's smoking. It's still smoking. There's still something there. And I'll give a spark to that. And it will produce light. And it will be effective because I love them so much. God is not against you. God is never against you. He is always for you. He is always for his people. And, and again, as, as believers, if we see people that are down and oppressed and weakened, your ministry is to them. Your ministry, leave everything and minister to that person. Not in pointing out their weaknesses or their sin or their defection or their broken or their smoking flask, or, or, or their bruised reed. We don't need to point that out. God is going to use that weakness for his glory. And, and that's a beautiful, wonderful thing. All right, so let's, um, by the way, um, you're, you, you give uh, Steve a hand for going to Pakistan and coming back, and, and, and Myra, too, for putting up with that. Um, but... Um, because also, if he didn't come back on time, I was going to do an introduction on complaining. We'll get there. Oh, boy. Yeah. You have a, can you fill in the blank? You always have something to blank about. Complain. Oh, so you guys know. So you guys are familiar with that saying. Yeah. Yeah. So... Praise the Lord. Turn, <laughs> turn in your Bibles to Zechariah. Are you guys turning? Chapter 3. <clears throat> in this amazing book of Zechariah. And um, this is a, um, like an end times teaching. What is it? Apoc apocalyptic? Apocalyptic teaching. And um, in the Bible, um, we have what? Who do we, we have? Uh, we have Daniel that taught that. We have uh, Ezekiel that talk about that, John. And, and, and listen to this. All of those three, none of them did it in Israel. They did it outside of Israel. Zechariah is the only one that does it from within Israel. So just an interesting thought there. And there are, there are, Ten visions that God gives him. So we're going to be here at about six. No, 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 I'm not going over ten. I'm just, I I'm just want to concentrate on a couple here. Um, but, um, but they're amazing. They're, um, they're, they're, they're so good as far as us for instructing and teaching and learning a spiritual application that can be applied in our lives and to know that God is not against me and that he has a plan for us. And, and it's wonderful. It's wonderful to, um, to be able to rest in what God is doing in our lives. Don't get so far ahead of God that you miss him. Don't get ahead of the Holy Spirit. Um, because then you're really walking in the flesh. You can quote spiritual things, but we are, we're not walking with God. We're walking, I'm, I'm walking my agenda and God catch up to me. You know, bless me as I do this. No, this is a work of God. 
you are just a vessel being used. Don't get so proud and puffed up. Any, any, any will use you. He'll slow you down. He'll definitely slow you down. Um, okay, so um, in verse 3, this is the first vision is about, um, um, about Joshua. And Joshua was a high priest. By the way, this is not Joshua that, um, that took the Israelites into the promised land who succeeded Moses. This ain't that Joshua. It's not the Joshua over here. This is, this is Joshua that came from Babylon that they made a high priest out of. And the name Joshua means God saves. What a, what a beautiful name. God saves. And um, I remember when, um, when the angel was dealing with... Um, um, let me let me turn there. Math, Matthew chapter one. He's um, well. Uh, he's the angel's dealing with Joseph, who doesn't know whether to put Mary away or not. You know because she is pregnant, and it wasn't him. And that's what they did. And the and the the Bible says the angel of the Lord came and told him, uh, "You will have a son. His name will be Jesus." And what is what does the angel say? And he will save my people. Well, only God can save, so this is telling you now that Jesus Christ is God in, in the flesh. He will save my people. That's Joshua and Jesus are the same name. It's the exact same name. So, um, so that's about this priest Joshua. God saves, Matthew 121. And, um, and here it shows that Joshua the high priest was standing before, in verse 1, was standing before the angel of the Lord, and all of a sudden, Satan is standing there also to resist him. Verse 1. Satan is standing to resist. Do you know Satan resists you? You know, everything that we are going to do um, in our walk, if it's for God, Satan is resisting it. Now, there are many things that we're going to do in the flesh, and Satan backs off. But now that you want to be a high, you want access into the priesthood, this is a high priest being prepared, Satan is going to resist it because it's a work of God. He permits all the other things, any work of God, he's going to resist it in your life. You are going to face resistance. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Now, a lot of us think that we have to then step in and unresist him, you know, but that's not what the Bible says. Verse 2, it says, and the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke you. You know, we think we've got to go around rebuking everything. Here, the Lord rebuked Satan. You know, I don't, I didn't, Joshua didn't have to say anything. You know, I rebuke you. He didn't have to do any of that. God did it. God does this for us. God rebuked him. And then, and then he says like this. Then he says this. And even Jerusalem rebukes you, Satan. Even Jerusalem rebukes you. And what does that mean? It's a, and then he says this amazing quote. Is not a brand plucked out of the fire? Wow. That is a powerful, powerful verse. Isn't the brand plucked out of the fire? Now, think of what's going on here. They have just come back from captivity. They've just been in slavery. They've been in bondage. Seventy years under Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed and wiped out Israel, wiped out Jerusalem, wiped out the temple, burned it to the ground. The only thing that is left of anything there was ashes and smoke and just destroyed, completely destroyed. There's nothing that can be built there. That was the purpose. So Nebuchadnezzar's thought was they'll never be able to come back and build this. Never. And sometimes in our lives, that's what we think. We've been damaged so bad in areas of our life that this can never be repaired. This can never be fixed. It can never be built back up again. You know, and we can't get over it. Because my mind continues to take me to these areas where I've got great pain in my life. 
And God's saying, it's time to build. It's time to build. And, and so can a brand be plucked out of the fire? So the only thing is here is, is, is ashes and, and ruins. And where do you even start? And this is what, was beco- this is what eventually is going to become overwhelming to, to a couple of these people that we're going to talk about. It's going to be overwhelming. It's too big of a thing. But, but you know what? God sees that and sees life. And God sees your weaknesses and he sees life. And God sees your heartache and your setbacks and, and your things that can't be built upon again. And, and he sees life. Now, um, John Wesley, he looked at this verse and, um, and he referred it to even himself. Because it's like my life is so burnt. My life has been so destroyed. My life is in ruins sometimes. And, and, but God will see life in it. God can pluck that right out of the fire. And I love that. That, that branding thing, I, can he pluck a, that brand is like, um, like a fire stick thing where you would jab and you know, spark that up again. That's, that's what he's talking about here. That's, that can be used to pull you out. And um, so there, there's, there's amazing hope for people that have no hope. And it proves and shows to us that God, God is not against you even with all of this. So, in this part of the vision with Joshua, um, so in the, um, this is like vision um, five, six, and seven, um, the next two chapters. Uh, The beginning parts were visions about the returning out of captivity and out of slavery. And that's a wonderful vision that people can get set free and delivered. But now the visions change. And now they're going to start talking about inward salvation. And this is an amazing thing because it's now going to be an inward work of God. And and in that, um, Joshua the high priest has got dirty garments and he's... Um, and but God's going to clean him, and God's going to wash him, and there, and there's a picture. There's a reason why he takes off the old and puts on the new, and it's such a beautiful picture of the New Testament in Colossians chapter three, where he says, "Put off your old, get rid of all that old garbage and that old sin in your life. Put that all off and put on the new," because. God wants you to be in the new because it, it, it's, hard, it's hard for God. It, well, it isn't hard for him. It's just, it's just man cannot be used if they're living in sin. Man cannot be used. You know, it's, so God puts on this new garment, puts off the old garment, and puts on the new. Where was Joshua at? He was in a country that was not clean. He was in many gods, foreign gods. He was in a land that taught them totally different. There's no worshiping of God. There was no temple. There was none of that. The diets were changed. Everything was different. And and Joshua had to come back and get cleaned. And this is the picture of this. He, he He brought old garments back. And, he, and, and this is our old nature, and, and God rips that off and puts on a new garment, gives us a new garment because we have to be cleansed. And that cleansing must come from outside of us. We, we don't do it. We cannot wash ourselves. We can get out of debt if somebody pays for me to be out of debt, but they can't cleanse me. They can't wash me. I must need a new garment. And it's amazing how this garment follows the Bible all the way through, even through Revelations, where it says the church will be clothed 
in a new garment. It's a robe of righteousness in, in Isaiah 61. And, and we are clothed with that new garment. And even the, uh, the wedding feast, it says we're going to have a wedding feast, but the guest, everybody that comes into that wedding feast must have a new garment. Remember, sir, what are you doing? Why are, what, where is your garment? How did you get in here? Because we cannot come with the righteousness of ourselves. We can't be cleansed with our own works because we're going to be patting ourselves on the back for everything that we do. This is a work of God in your life. And praise Him for that. It's the exchange of our righteousness or our sin for God's holy righteousness that was found in Jesus Christ. This is why righteousness in the Bible in Romans 3 and 4 is a gift. You can't be righteousness on your own and you can't pay for it. It's Christ's righteousness. The word is imputed. So this is what happens. We, we get this outside of ourselves and God says, take that off and put this on him. And, and the only thing Joshua was there, he couldn't even resist it. He's just standing there. He's just standing there and receiving that. So that, that becomes amazing to think about. In the, uh, I, I want to go into this next one. Um, and it starts in chapter 4. And now we're going to introduce a, uh, another person. And this is uh, Rubabel. And um, so we got Joshua, who's the high priest, and now Zerubbabel, who basically, when he came back from Babylon with the group, God allowed him to lead the people. So he was like put in the position of the king. So now we have, that, that's what we've got going on here. And this is the next vision, and that takes place in chapter 4. It says, <clears throat> verse 1, And the angel that ta uh, talked with me came again, and he waked me as a man that was waking out of a sleep. Uh, so you got to think of all this. This is, this is now they're going to be building the temple. You've got all this stuff going on, and if you see that and you're the king of now coming into this, this can get very overwhelming in my life. Any of you been overwhelmed in life by something that happened? It, it just became too big for you? And, and right away we start to come up and make excuses why I can't do it. And, and, that, and that's fine because you can't do it. God will re show you that you're right, you can't. But... Um, and, and here's another thing. This isn't a dream. This is a vision. A vision is something that happens while you're awake. This is something that you physically see while you're awake. And, and this is how God is speaking to them, and it's amazing. He, he, Zerubbabel is so wore out, and sometimes in our life we get so wore out on things. And we're over, it, it, it makes us overwhelmed because I'm wore out. The challenge is too difficult. The task in front of me is too hard. I can't do it. I can't handle it. And, and, and no, but that's, that's, that's where God is planning him. This is what God is starting to show him. But he had to wake him up so he could see it. I just want to sleep. I just need right. No, you need to see this. And he starts to talk to him. He said unto me, what do you see? And he says, and I looked in verse 2, and behold, a candlestick of all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it. Seven lamps were on seven pipes to seven lamps. So the, there, here's this candlestick, and it had a tube across with seven, uh, um, uh, um, seven pipes coming down, each of them a lamp. And on top of all of that was a bowl. Got it? I, I, I could draw it, but I don't think you want to see that. Um, so that, that's what's going on. And then in verse 3, on the side of that, there were two olive trees. One on the right, one on the left. One on the right, one on the left. Um, 
And then, and then just, just let me read the rest to here. So, so I answered and spoke unto the angel and talked to him, saying, talked with me, saying, what are these? What, what is this? What is this meaning? What is this about? And the angel talked to me and answered and said, knowest not what this is? And he says, no, Lord. And, and, and this is an interaction of going back. Do you know what this is? No. And, and it's like an interaction saying, but you should. That's what it's really meaning. You don't know what it is, but you should know what this means. It's like, do you know that you're saved? Do you know that? Because the Bible's, the Bible's clear and says you can know. You can know what salvation is. It says in 1 John 5, 12, 13, these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. So there are things that we can know from the Bible that teaches us clear and precise. And then when you get that truth, there's no argument. There's no arguing it. You know it. You can know it. God wants us to be sure and to know that this Bible is true and what it says is is yes. And it's never no. It's always yes and amen. It's never no. It's always for you. So here with Z- uh, um, Zerubbabel, why don't you know this? You should know this. But how gentle he is, he's going to explain it again. So, um, so, so look at it. Let me, let me just go over a couple of things here. So this candlestick... In the Bible, when we see that word candlestick, it means a lampstand. It's the same thing as a lampstand. So you see this through the Bible now. You see this in Revelations where Jesus Christ, our high priest, by the way, he's our high priest, he walked in the midst of the candlesticks, it said. He walked right in the middle of the candlesticks. And in Revelations, those candlesticks meant the church. It was a picture of the church, the the seven churches in Asia Minor. And, um, and what does a lampstand do but give great light? And Jesus Christ is the light of the world in John 8, 12. And the churches in Revelation should be a great light. Are you a light in your ministry? Or are you preaching doom and gloom? Or what, what I mean... What is our ministry? Are we encouraging people in their walk and giving them hope in a, in a time where things look pretty dim out there? But you're, you, we're still, we're still, we still got some smoke coming. We still, he has not put us out yet, you know. So, um, so that, that's the picture there. And then, um, and then Zerubbabel. Okay, so where are we at? Four, six. Look at this. He says, and then he answered, and he spoke unto me, saying, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Here's the word. This is, this is the word of God. And you know what? Our truth comes from the word of God. And we might not know maybe a lot of things, but that truth will come from the word of God. The Word of God will speak into a manner, into a fashion that, that speaks to our spirit within us that is born again. And then it becomes truth. It becomes truth within us. And he says, um, this is the word of Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. You are going to build this temple is what he's saying. You know, we use this a lot in the Christian, I mean, the churches love to use this verse. But this is about building the temple. And Zerubbabel saying, I, there's no way. There's no way that this can be built. You know, and this is, and, and really what God's doing in this, it's, this isn't a building of the temple to restore the things the way they used to be. And that's sometimes what we think. Well, this is the way it's always been. No. So this is not what God wants. God is doing this so he can have a relationship and fellowship with his people. That's the purpose. And, and, and even the temple of the, of the 
New Testament saint. The temple of God abides within. And it's a temple of fellowship and communion and, and you know, unity and the body of Christ. You know, you, we look around and we got people from everywhere here. You know, all kinds of areas. And, and, and then there's Mirtha, you know, but, but, but we've, got, we've got all of this. By the way, this, you know how many, no, I, I was going to say, you know how many subs this lady made last week? Subs were on sale at Publix, by the way, so she's. Anyway, okay, so not, not by power, not by might, but by my spirit. Not, look at this stuff, not by physical strength, not by physical strength, not by human strength. This thing is going to be built not by physical strength, not by human strength, not by mental know-it-all, not by mental uh, strength, but only through the Spirit of God. Wow. How many things do we attempt in our physical, mental, and human strength? And then, and then it comes crashing down. And we want to know, but, but we're not going to take blame. You know, we're not going to take blame for that. But, um, but yeah, just by the Spirit of God. And then, verse 7, I love this part. It says, who art thou, O great mountain? Turn in your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 2. This is the this is the this is the mountain of of the Lord and that's considering the mountain of the Lord's house in Zion and that's where the temple was built and it's an amazing mountain the temple of God and in verse 2 it says and it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above all the hills and all the nations shall flow up to it. Usually in a mountain that is high, things flow down. But here, everything's going to flow up. All the nations of the world are going to flow up to the mountain of God, to the house of God. This is what it's speaking of. And many people shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, the house of God of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion comes forth the law and the word of the Lord from Ju Jerusalem. Remember in um, Matthew 17, he says, it's going to come a day where you're going to be able to say to that mountain, go into the sea. And, um, and, and it's amazing. And, and then it says, in, in, back in 7, it says, Before Z Zerubbabel shall come, shall, thou shalt become a plain. This whole big great mountain shall just become a plain. <laughs> and, and, and this is a vision of the, the New Testament believer where the temple of God will abide within. It shall be a plain and, and, and shall bring forth a headstone. The, this, this headstone is a cap. It's a cap that is put on the top. When everything is finished, they cap it off with a head, headstone, a top piece. Only when it's complete. Only when things are finished, this goes on the top. You don't, put the, you don't put it on before. You don't put it on in the beginning or the middle of this. You, you put it on at the end. So it's the ending piece is what it says in the Hebrew. The ending piece. And, and, the, and therefore, that ending piece, there's going to be shouting that's going to come forth when that top is put on. 
because things are finished, things are done. Everything is coming to a completion now. We're seeing the final product. We're seeing the finished work. We're seeing God in all of its entirety and the glory of God. And then the people of God coming out of that because that's the church of the living God. And they're going to put this cap on and they're going to just yell and scream, grace, grace. Because that's how people are saved. Through the grace of God, it's not a work by man. It's not by power. It's not by might. But it's only by the Spirit of God that one can be saved and be delivered from from slavery and from all the entanglement and all the bondage that Satan puts upon mankind. Because God is not against you. God is always for you. Grace, grace. The shoutings of grace... And, um, and, and yeah, that's, you know, this is the temple before being complete, and then the cap is put on, and, and it is finished. The finished work of Jesus Christ. And then I love this. In verse 10, he then says, he says, well, well let me do nine first. It says, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of the house. This is good. So Zerubbabel has laid the foundation. How important is our foundation, church? How important is for you to know that you are on a firm foundation, which means I cannot be moved. I cannot be shaken. I'm not going to be tumbling because the foundation is cracking. There could be things in my life that are cracking and don't look good and and look like things are breaking up, but no, you're on a firm, solid foundation foundation and that foundation is jesus christ and and then and it says and his hands will finish it so he's going to lay the it it means it's all going to come through zerubbabel it's all going to come through the king remember that it's all going to come through the king not the priest is somewhere but the king is now involved the king is involved um Uh, Yeah, the eyes, the eyes of the Lord, they run to and fro through the whole world. Verse, yeah, verse, verse 10. Look at this. Because when we look at things, and we look at things that are so big before us, and we think we're alone, and we think we can't do it, or can't complete it, or can't finish it, and, um, and then we get wore out, and I need some time off, and I need to rest up and, and, you know, people are dropping off and quitting and, you know. But, um, but we go on with God. You know, though none will come with me, though I will follow. And it's learning to just trust in, in, in the little things You know, we, we want to see big things happening. You know, this was all about creating a, the big temple and putting it back to the way it used to be. And God says, no, it ain't going to work that way. It's going to be different. Verse 10, for who has despised the day of small things? You know, who goes around saying that that is not effective that cannot produce anything. Ho, ho, ho. God is so mighty. And he uses, he uses peculiar people. Me, not you. You're, you're amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he uses the small things to show how great he is. Look at how small Israel is. Look at that dot in the middle of a map. You need a magnifying glass to even find it. You know. And uh, so we don't even, you know, so we don't look at numbers. Remember when David tried to count his army? (sighs) Not good. You know, they tried to stop him. Why do you want to count now? Why do you want to count how big you are? 
Don't despise the day of small things. God is working in the lives of people. The mission is not here in this building. The mission is to the streets. It's a vision for the city. And I love that. They shall rejoice when they see the plummet hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro the whole earth. And then verse 11, and we'll close here. It says, um, Then answered I and said unto him, What are these two olive trees? Hey, you, you talked about these. What are the olive trees? What are the olive trees? What, are, what is this standing for? You know, you've talked about everything. You've talked about the lampstands and the building and, and, um, and, and grace and the capstone and this great mountain, but what about the olive trees? And he said, what are these two olive trees upon the right sides of the candlesticks? One on the left and one on the right. And, and, and I said again, and, and I answered again and said unto him, what be these two? It repeat it with, with the two golden pipes that emptied gold oil out of them. And he said to me, knowest thou not these? I mean, it's like, you don't know this either? You know, you didn't know that? You know, but, and, and he said, no, my Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones. Now, uh, in the Bible, it talks about two witnesses, and, you know, you can, you can debate, and we have here, <laughs> uh, I mean, long periods of time. Oh, no, it's this and this, it's this and that. And, and you know, there's many, you know, clues of, of who and what. But you know what? They don't name them here. And it's not about the two witnesses. They're going to be anointed with the power of God to go forward. But it's not about them. It's about Christ. It's always about Christ. It's not about the two witnesses are going to be used mightily and they're going to be heavily anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. But it's not about the two witnesses. It's about God. It's always about God. But these two witnesses here, they, they are uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Um, because this is a vision and it's about that. And, and think about that. One was a high priest and the other one was a king. And this, is, this office of the high priest and the office of the king are going to be united together in one form in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is our high priest and he is going to be the great reigning king. And every knee will bow before him and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. But it's, 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 a, uh, it's an amazing office that is joined together uh, in Christ. And it's just not about rebuilding the temple. This is about a new spiritual life that God is going to be going forward with. It. And you know what? And even in the church, we see so many things that, that pertain to us here. And we can, we can receive from it greatly and get very excited with, with our future and with what God's doing and that you're not alone, and God has a plan for you, and I don't care what you've done, it doesn't even matter. We don't, I don't want to make sin the issue. You'll hear it. You'll hear to restrain from it, because it is, I mean, the cross, we, we are crucified with Christ, and we do not have grace just to sin, and, because we, we don't want to cause, shall we say in Romans 6, shall we say, um, Grace shall abound, you know, because sin abounds, let grace abound more. No, we're, we're not promoting that at all. We're promoting a clean, obedient life unto God. Holy, holy life. But if you sin, you have an advocate who is Christ Jesus. But, um, but you know, our sin has been crucified and we can live that life. We can live a life where we know that our sin is, is, is upon the cross. And, and we, we don't live unto sin, we, we, we live unto Christ. He's, he's the giver of our life. So amen. 
So, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time and this teaching. And, and while you are doing such an amazing work in, in the people of God, called by your name, and we thank you, Father, that you love us and that you'll never leave us and that you are with us. And, and boy, uh, help us never to despise the day of small things. Let us never look and say, oh, this is just a little thing. Oh, it's, it's so big for God. God can turn that little thing into, or, or can turn the impossible to possible. You know, all things are possible to Christ, in Christ to those that believe on his name. And uh, we thank you, Father, for this amazing love. If there's somebody here today Salvation is a great thing. Salvation is part of putting on the end cap, the capstone. And in that, we, we learn and understand the fullness of God in my life. That now, because of that, I am complete in Him. And, and because I'm complete, I lack nothing spiritually. All of this has been given to God. In Colossians chapter 3, it says, put off all these things. And there's a list of anger and malice and all this garbage. And it says, put it off. In, in other words, start believing God. Start believing God in your life. Live for God. Live for Christ. Put off the old man, but put on the new that is formed in righteousness and holiness. Receive salvation today. It is a gift. God saves. If there's somebody here that has never accepted Christ with nobody looking around, just pray. We're praying for everybody here and we're praying for this city praying for families and praying for children, praying for those who are locked in and praying for those who are oppressed, praying for those who are in addictions and praying for those who are lonely, praying for the hopeless and the widow and the, uh, the drug addict. Lord, thank you that you break the chains if there's somebody here that has never accepted Christ, just lift up your hand. Let me pray for you. Salvation is a gift. It's by that grace, grace that we cry. We thank you, Father. Yes, Lord. And give us souls, Lord. Give us souls. Bless the offering. Bless our wrap afterwards. We thank you and bless the closing song. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.